So today I'm going to cover a few topics. The first is going to be the history of modern cryptography. Uh, then I'm going to try to explain the theory behind quantum physics and how this, <laughs> and how this all pertains to your personal privacy and national security in under 10 minutes. <laughs> so any of us who've had the experience of transacting business on the internet we know that if we're either buying something on Amazon or uh, sending a secure email, that we have a little bit of help to keep our privacy private. And that little bit of help are cryptographic algorithms that scramble everything we say and try to protect us uh, from bad actors who are trying to read our credit cards and just basically pry into our privacy. Unfortunately, there are a lot of bad actors and they're very skilled at actually breaking some of our cryptography and therefore, you know, we're in a position where a lot of our information, and especially for the nation, our national secrets are, are at stake. So, you know, I mentioned how, how many hackers there are and just how good they're getting. I mean, can you imagine 14.7 billion records have been stolen since 2013. And there are some really big ones out there. Yahoo, three billion. Marriott, half a billion. And if you can read the fine print, Marriott, it was happening to them for over four years and they didn't know about it. And my personal favorite is the Office of Personal Management. This is, uh, <laughs> this is personal to me and my wife because our records were stolen and uh, at least the government gave us a two-year subscription uh, to LifeLock. So I, I don't know how that's working, but so far we haven't lost our identity. So I promised to talk about a little bit of the, the history of modern cryptography. It's really fascinating because it's not that old. It's really only about uh, 43 years old. And these fellows are sort of the fathers of modern cryptography. So in 1976, and on your right is Whitfield Diffie, and then there's Marty Hellman in the middle, and then graduate student Ralph Merkel. Uh, in 1976, they came up with public key cryptography. And it's a huge deal. I mean, it's what everything uses on the internet. So, you know, it was recognized as being such a huge deal a couple of years ago, when in 2015, Whit Diffie and Marty Hellman won the Turing Award, uh, which is sort of the Nobel Prize for computer science because they don't give a Nobel Prize out in computer science. Um, so in any event, what they did is really great. It worked from 1976. It works today, but it's being threatened. You know, so let's just talk about very briefly what cryptography is. So in order for me to transmit something secretly, I need three elements. I need data to go from point A to point B. I need a cryptographic algorithm that's going to scramble everything and make it impossible for somebody to read. And then I need something very special called a cryptographic key. And it's that key that unlocks the mystery when you get your information transmitted to the destination. So these keys work great right from the time that these fellows invented it. But what's been happening over the years is that these keys are getting cracked uh, really by some very talented, nefarious actors. So let me tell you what a key is. It's a big number, okay? And it's usually two big prime numbers that are multiplied together and they make an even bigger number, but not prime. So in order to break the key, you have to factor the number into its primes, and then you can use that to decipher the secret information. Well, over the years, we started with smaller numbers, like 56 digits wide, and they were broken pretty easily. In fact, the NSA broke them almost immediately. Um, but every time one of these keys is broken, we double its size so that we say, well, you know, maybe it'll be harder for them to break a bigger number. Well, this has been going on now for 40 years, and the last number that was broken was 768 digits wide. 
It's a huge number. And at the time, they were saying it would take a computer three million years to figure it out. Well, I actually figured it out in three years, so, so much for that estimate. Uh, well, today we use numbers that are even more incredibly big, 2,048 digits wide. And we've decided that it would take our current computers, the best ones we have, a billion, billion years to break that. So you'd say, wow, this is great, and I have nothing to worry about. Well, let's fast forward to today. And where you, what you're looking at is really an amazing device. It's a quantum computer. It's IBM's quantum computer. And this one came out in January of 2017. Now, it's not powerful enough yet to solve that billion, billion year problem. But it's going to be. And when it is, that billion, billion year problem can be solved by this machine in one minute. So you can see we, we have a huge national risk here that our entire encryption system could be destroyed. So let me tell you a little bit about a quantum computer, but not too much. And uh, the reason why they're so effective and, and they're so much better than what we have now is because they work on the principles of quantum physics. And one of the biggest principles is the fact that if you have a one and a zero in a regular computer, that's all you have, a one and a zero. But in a quantum computer, the bits can be ones, zeros, and they can be ones and zeros at the same time. And what that enables the quantum computer to do is process information trillions of times faster than our conventional computers or our classical computers that we use today. So, you know, I mentioned that IBM came out with this in 2017, and then they began improving it, and then Google got into the mix, and today these computers now are about a tenfold increase in capacity in just a little over a year which when you think about Moore's law, which says every two years a classical computer doubles its capacity, this is frighteningly fast. Well, not so coincidentally, in November of 2017, just 10 months after this was announced, NIST called the entire world and said, we'd like people to start submitting new algorithms for a new standard in encryption. And they said, we want these algorithms to be quantum resistant. Not quantum proof, but quantum resistant. So in November of 2017, they got 82 algorithms sent to them from all over the world. And since then, they've eliminated all but 26 of them, which means it's going to be pretty hard to get a really good quantum resistant algorithm. And they estimate that it's going to be about five years before they do standardize a new encryption standard. So, you know, you might say, well, how long is it going to be before a good quantum computer can factor that billion, billion year number? And the answer to that is nobody really knows. People say three years, five years, some say ten. But it's almost an immaterial point because What's happening is bad actors are stealing our data now. They steal our conventional key now, and then they store it. It's called a harvesting attack. I think my records from OPM are probably just being stored somewhere. At least I pray they are. But when a quantum computer is available, then they can crack the key and read that data. So the problem's here, and it's here now. So what can we do, you know, in the face of this incredible machine? How can we stop it? Well, it turns out there is a way to stop it. And that way is by creating a new special key made out of light. So we're going to fight quantum with quantum. So what we're doing is we're building these cryptographic keys out of photons. And why is that important? Well, there's a special law of physics that says if you observe a group of photons, just the act of observing them destroys their quantum state. So just think of that, a key crossing 
from point A to point B, somebody tries to intercept it, the key changes all of its numbers, now the key is useless. And I have a little video to show you how that works. So we can send millions of individual photons down a fiber. It's called quantum key distribution. We encode each one of these photons with a one or a zero. And we transmit it to the far side where the data is going. When these quantum keys get to that destination, they're a unique key and they're unbreakable. This is a great segue into the, the, to the topic. Now, what happens, though, if somebody tries to observe? Well, the ones and zeros switch. They change all around. And the key becomes useless. It can't be used to decrypt the data. And in fact, it's tamper evident. So we know that somebody tampered with it. We don't send the data. So this is a terrific solution that's ready today and one that we can use to protect our privacy and national security. So we're unfortunately once again in a race to see who reaches quantum supremacy. And as you can see by the relative amount of dollars that have been invested, uh, the United States is playing catch up. In fact, the 1.2 billion that the United States just procured for the Quantum Initiative Act was just signed into law in late December. So we haven't even deployed any of that. Well, the Chinese are outspending us and they're outthinking us because they have an incredible strategy. Our strategy is build quantum computers, you know, yay IBM, yay Google, and uh, yay NIST for getting us uh, new cryptographic algorithms that are quantum resistant. China's doing one thing more. China is also doing quantum key distribution and they're doing it in a big way. This is a picture of a satellite that they put in space, and they're now bouncing quantum keys off that satellite and transmitting them thousands of miles around the world. So they've got a really good strategy, and we've got a big fight on our hands. You know, a picture like this I saw in the 60s when the Soviets put Sputnik up and that kind of spurred us on to take the lead in the space race. I'm hoping that seeing this picture will help us take the lead in the quantum supremacy race. And actually, this is a race that the United States cannot afford to come in second. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time.